inspired word of God, that you breathe these very words, your words, your heart, on the pages so that we can read, Lord, and see history, to see the things that men have done that have messed up majorly so that we can learn and not have to make the same mistakes. Lord, you did this because of pure love. Lord, you love us so much that you want what's best for us. Your word declares that you're jealous for us. And Lord, we thank you for your jealousy. We thank you that you want nothing but the best for us. So Lord, help us to learn that we may not go astray, that we may just follow your path. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So in Isaiah chapter 1 and 2, we kind of went through a little history and then we went all the way to the millennial kingdom, uh, Isaiah prophesying of things to come. He went all the way to the time when we, we, when we just came out of Revelation, but in the time when Jesus will rule and reign in righteousness on the earth for 1,000 years. And that's where Isaiah found himself. Uh, and in chapter 3, it picks off where we left off in the millennial kingdom where, uh, well, actually in chapter 2, it talks about how they will take their weapons and beat them into, into uh, you know, pruning hooks and, 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 and um, you know, tools instead of weapons, right? And in chapter 3, he continues, For behold, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. So again, it, 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 Jerusalem is where God is going to set up his earthly kingdom. But before they can enjoy or before the people of the earth can enjoy the millennial kingdom, listen, it's going to be a time of tribulation. And, and he is saying here, the, behold, the Lord of hosts will do what in Jerusalem? He will take away their stock and their store. In other words, he will take away their supply and their support. You see, all of us are dependent upon bread and water. We're dependent upon our homes. These are the things that are essential for us to live. But you see, if God, if we are going astray and there's nothing that God can do to get our attention, sometimes he has to take away just the very the bare necessities of life, right? Our food and water are our, our, our protection. And that is exactly what he will do. Again, in the tribulation, what is the purpose of the tribulation? To bring, to bring back the people of God the Israelites back to a relationship with him. So he's going to set on fire. He's going to do things to bring them back. And then in, in verse 2, he's going to talk about he's going to take away their leaders. Uh, look at verse 2. The mighty man, excuse me, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the diviners and the elders. So he's taking away all of their, their leaders, their military leaders, their governors and and the spiritual leaders, and with no leaders, the people will be, well, they will go astray. You, you know, we, uh, even in this country, we have governors and we have presidents, and why do we have them? Listen, in hopes, and I, I have a big hope, not the hope of the Bible, but in hopes, right, that they will lead us into doing what is right. A lot of times they do what is wrong, but even a corrupt, govern, a gov corrupt king is better than no king, right? Uh, and so God put those in place. But here he's saying, I'm going to take away your supply and your stock. I'm going to take away your leaders. He's also going to take away their skilled workers. Look at verse 3. The captain of 50 and the honorable men, the counselors and the skin, skillful artisan, and the expert uh, enchanter. So he's taking away their skilled workers. Again, when you have people in a city, in a community that's working with their hands and producing, what does that do? It produces uh, wealth, right? When we produce something with our hand, it produces wealth. So he's, he's going to mess with their, uh, their economy by taking away their skilled workers. Uh, look also, he will take away, well, not, not that he will take away, but actually he will give them now boss babies. Look at verse 4. I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. What does that mean? Does it mean that that uh, your, your children will be saying, all right, come on now, uh, start working. Uh, no, I believe what he's really saying here is that the children will be unruly. 
If you look at our, our society today, what do we see? You, you go into one of those stores and you will see the kids there demanding, ah, right? They're yelling and they're screaming at their parents, okay, okay, I'll give it to you, Johnny. Here's a candy, here's a candy. That is what happens when a society begins to break down, when the family breaks down uh, and is, is a really a result of, of not uh, building a family on the foundation of God. When you don't have God as a foundation, it all crumbles. It all, uh, you know, goes backwards. And so the children uh, have, um, are, are, are just unruly. You know, that's, that song, I mentioned it before, it's not a godly song, it's not even a good song, but there's that one line in Whitney Houston's song, I believe the children are our future, teach them well and let them lead the way, which is good, which is true, right? If we are not training our children the right way to go, listen, in the future, they will be our next presidents, they will be our next uh, preachers and our next police officers, and if they don't know what is right, guess what? They will lead people to error. They will lead uh, uh, the wrong way. And, and listen, parents, let me tell you, uh, Sunday school teachers, you may feel like your work is, is, is a waste of time. No, it's not. Listen, we have an opportunity to pour into the next generation of leaders. If we're not teaching our children, then who will? Uh, again, I think back to, you know, the 70s and, and you know, late 70s, early, uh, late 60s, early 70s, during the hippie movement, you know, everybody was happy and love and smoking weed. And do you know that there are presidents and our, our governors and, and leaders today? That's who's leading. So we don't need to make the same mistake. We need to teach our children so when they grow up and when they go out, they will lead in godly ways. Verse 5, the people will be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The children will be insolent towards their elders and the, uh, the, the base towards, uh, toward the honorable. So people will be turning against each other, right? When you, when you look at a society, you can tell the, the temperature of the people by the way that they treat each other. I look at when, uh, when I was in um, f South Florida, oh man, people <laughs> did not treat each other very nicely there. You know, last time I drove down to uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, I was going down to Fort Lauderdale, but as soon as you reach West Palm Beach, that's South Florida, people were cutting each other off on the road. Road rage, right? They're not treating each other friendly. When I moved up here, I remember the first time we went into, I think I went into um, Home Depot, and I said, sir, can you help me find, you know, whatever it was? Oh, sure, come over here. Uh, I was shocked, number one, that I found anyone to help me. <laughs> in South Florida, you're looking, you're walking the whole store. I think everyone is hiding in some back room or something because they don't want to help you. And when, when you do find them and say, hey, can you, uh, can I... Uh, help you, you know, can you f help me find this item? And they'll say, ah, I'll five, you know, and they just start, keep walking the other way. But here it was like, wow, you know, come, let me show you. Is there anything else I can do for you? I was completely shocked. Gigi and I looked at each other like, are we in another world? But I noticed yeah. that was 12 years ago. I noticed that it, things have started to change a little. Why? Because all of the people from South Florida have migrated up here. But I believe when you look at the bigger the city, the more ungodly it is because everybody is into themselves. They put God aside, and because they have put God aside, they're leaning on their own wickedness of their heart. And that's what we see here in this, <clears throat> uh, in verse 5, that people are turning against each other because, again, God is not the center. Um, we also will see things that are out of control. Um, you know, people will be... So out of control that people will be desperate for leader. Look at verse 6. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have clothing, uh, you be our ruler, and let these ruins be under your power. Now, again, during the tribulation time, things will be so bad that people will be desperate for a good leader. They will be so desperate that they will say, Hey, you know, you look the part. You look like a leader. 
can you take this job and fix things and make things right? Uh, it's, it's a mess around here. And they're going to be so desperate, it doesn't matter who it is. They're going to say, you be the leader. We want to elect you. And, and, and I believe, you know, this will be, I believe this is the reason why even for some of us here in America, we're, we're willing to, uh, um, you know, elect non-politicians, right? Anyone that can make a, this mess, just fix the things that are wrong, people get desperate. But look at what he says here in verse 7. In that day he will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, for in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people. That person that they are trying to elect will say, I have my own problems. <laughs> I, I got no, my own issues in my own house. I, I, I don't want to have to deal with the problems of the nation, right? Um, and so I believe... In that day, during the time of tribulation, because things will be so bad, listen, it will be a great opportunity for Antichrist to come. Do you see how it works? The Antichrist will say, I have the, pro I have the solution for your problem. I have the solution for the money problem. I have the solution for the food problem. I have the solution. And so they will say, sure, go for it. Even if he is inexperienced, just as long as someone is standing up and boldly say, I can take on these problems, and the Antichrist will come on the scene. Verse 8, for Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doing are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So why are they stumbling? Why are they fallen? Listen, because their words and their actions are against God. They're denying God with their words and their actions while they're going into sin. Listen, we are in a, in a state, in a condition today where people's actions and their words are just blatant against the Lord. You know, in the past, people may have had ideas or thoughts about God that wasn't honorable, but man, they're blaring it all over the place now. They're making it known. They, uh, you know, pump their fist at God and really have no regards for Him. Verse 9, the, the look on their continents witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. You know, I remember a couple years ago um, in Jerusalem, they started the Gay Pride Parade there. And every year since, they've been having this Gay Pride Parade. It's actually in Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv, I believe, is one of the most ungodly cities uh, on the wor in the world today. Uh, I think they say it makes... Um, Las Vegas look friendly, you know. Um, but here it is in Jerusalem, in, the, in Judea, in the, 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 the city of God, <laughs> that people are parading themselves, uh, parading sin in the open streets, and, and they call it gay pride. They call it a pride parade. We are proud of our sin. Listen, that is a dangerous place to be. You know, if you, you know, for most of us, when we sin, it's like, I don't want anyone to see me, <laughs> you know. Uh, we're ashamed where, where we don't want to get caught. But to come out of that place and say, uh, I'm not only uh, not ashamed of my sin, but I'm proud. I'm going to uh, parade it all over the place. But listen, verse 9, woe to the soul. For they have brought evil on who? Upon themselves. When you do things that are sinful, listen, you're doing it to yourselves. And, 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 you know, the Lord says, woe to such a person. Verse 10, say to the righteous that it shall be with them, uh, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. Say to the righteous shall be well with them. And then he says, woe to the wicked, it shall be with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. You see, when we do good, we will be rewarded. But if you do evil, the Lord says, man, bad times are coming. You will be punished. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. If you sow goodness, you shall reap goodness. If you sow evil, you will reap evil. You, you can't get away from it. Don't think that you're going to sow evil and reap good. God will punish you for doing that. And oftentimes people who do evil, 
And when they get punished, when things come back, come around and that's bad in their life, they still turn around and say, God, it's your fault. I don't want anything to do with you, God, but it's your fault, right? You can't have it both ways. Verse 12, as, a man, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you curse you to err. Uh, excuse me, cause you to err and, and destroy the way of your paths. You see, the family in that day will be dysfunctional. As we see so many families today are dysfunctional. I remember a guy said, when it comes to his family, he says his family is the funk in dysfunctional, you know? Uh, that's what's going to happen. Their, their families will be the funk in dysfunctional. In those days, the children would be oppressing their parents. The women would rule. You see, God has designed the family in such a way, but people today say, I don't like that way. I'm going to do it my way. And what do we have today is what we have today. So uh, we see now in verse 13, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. So he's pleading and he's judging. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of the people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding their faces of the poor, says the Lord of hosts. You see, the Lord is dealing with them because of, well, what they're doing to the poor. You know, when, uh, again, uh, you look back a couple of years and they had that movement, we are the 99%, you remember that? The 1% of, of, uh, of the wealth, excuse me, 80% uh, of the wealth is, is owned by 90%, I mean, by 1% of, of, of the rich, most richest people, right? And so there's protests, oh, we are the 99, share some of the wealth, share some of the wealth, with some of us that are down here. But understand this. Listen, listen to these statistics. If you made $1,500 last year, you are in the top 20% of the world's income earner. Anyone made $1,500 here? <laughs> if you have sufficient food, decent clothes, live in a house of, or apartment, and have reasonable, reliable means of transportation, you are among the top 15% of the world's wealthiest people in the world. And if you earn $25,000 or more annually, you are in the top 10% of the world's income earner. You see, it's easy to protest. We are the 99, but what about the people who are really at the bottom that's pumping their fist at us and saying, well, why, why, why don't you share some of your wealth with us? You see, God doesn't have a problem with wealth, of us having wealth. The problem that he has is that when we hoard the wealth or when we abuse others to gain wealth, and we're not willing to take care of those that are in need because we're never satisfied with what God has given us. We always want more. And the more we have is the more we keep uh, just stuffing ourselves, buying more and more and accumulating more even as we studied in the men's study last night, that all of it will be burnt, <laughs> and we're accumulating. So he says in verse 16, Moreover, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Dian are haughty, and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, in other words, they're walking with their necks up, looking down on people, right? Uh, walking and mensing as they go, that, uh, making a Jingle with their feet. In other words, when they walk, man, they, 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 they you know, uh, make a click with their feet so that people will look on like, what's that noise? Ooh, you know, look at that girl, you know. Uh, so they're making a jingle with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. <laughs> He's going to reveal their nakedness, right? So here it is that these women are parading their beauty. They are parading their wealth. They have nose rings and belly chains and their, their perfumes. And, and God says, I will really show 
what they, who they really are on the inside, right? He will expose their nakedness. In verse 18, And that day the Lord will take away their finery, their jingling anklets, their scarves, uh, and their, their scents, their, uh, the pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the headdress, the headdresses, the leg ornaments, and the head bands, perfume boxes, the charms, and the rings and the, no the nose jewels. Man, all of these things, all of these things that they put on, uh, you know, parading their beauty, God said, I'm going to take it away. You know, when it comes to beauty, we spend so much time on the outward appearance and so little on the inward. What does God uh, look for in a woman? Listen, not the outward abraded of the hair, not the jewelry, but the inward quiet spirit. That is, that is what God wants, a gentle spirit, not one who is contentious, right? A gentle spirit. God wants the beauty from, to come from the inside, and so often we're investing so much. You go to the, you know, the, the stores, and you see they have aisles and aisles of, of makeup and all kinds of things to work on the outward. But how many times do women just get up in the morning and say, Lord, change me on the inside. Make me beautiful on the inside. Listen, that is what the Lord is pleased with. But yet we spend so little time investing on the inside. So God said, I'm going to expose the truth. Verse 24, and so it shall be, instead of sweet smell, there will be a stench. <laughs> instead of a sash, a rope around your neck. Instead of a girdle or uh, of sack, uh, instead of a, excuse me, instead of a well set hair, baldness. <laughs> instead of a rich robe, a girdle. Uh, a girdle of sackcloth, uh, the branding instead of a beauty. Yeah, you, you, instead of a beauty mark, you get a, a branding. You know, uh, it, um, your 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 men shall be shall fall by the sword, and your mighty in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit on the ground. So the Lord is saying, man, you guys are tooty, you know, fruity and uh, uh, looking down on people. Uh, listen, the judgment will come and it won't be pretty. So he goes into chapter four. And because of this time of judgment, listen, many of the men in those cities will be killed, right? Uh, in, in wars, in battles, they will lose their lives. And in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we'll, uh, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. You see, because of the death, because of the battles, so many men will, be, will lose their life. It will be seven women for every one man. And there will be a shortage of men. And so the women will go around saying, hey, I'll provide for myself. You don't have to provide for me. Just give me your last name. Give me a child, right? I just want to, to not be alone. I just don't want to, to be in that position. And, and they're going to be very desperate uh, looking for a man. And so verse uh, 2 to 5, they're going to talk about the branch, which is, the, you know, Jesus Christ himself, in that day, the branch the, of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth shall be excel, excellent and appealing for those, in, the, those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is, is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord has washed away the filth of, Zion, of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So we have here this reference. Notice that the branch in verse 2 is capital B. This is a reference to the Lord himself. And so the branch, he will prune uh, and, and wash and burn away the unrighteous, again, during this time of tribulation. And, and 
even though he's dealing with the, the unrighteous, the righteous will be in the midst, and they're going to feel some of the fire. But understand this, when, when God is dealing with our sin, when he's purging, when he's washing, when he's, 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 he's cleansing us, listen, it's never a pleasant feeling, right? It feels like fire. Well, when I was growing up, I felt a lot of fire from my dad. <laughs> it was on my rear end. But why did he do it? Is it, because, is it because of hate? No, he was trying to get rid of the sin in my life. The, the, the misbehavior, the bad behavior, in my, he was dealing with it. And in the same way, when God is going to cleanse and purge the world of the sin, he's going to set it with fire. And yes, it may not be pleasant, but it's profitable. Because notice that he said that when he does it, it will be beautiful and appealing. And those who are left will be called what? Holy. You see, the discipline of God will make us holy. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 11, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And sometimes when God is correcting us, we think that he's against us and we, we, we feel like he is trying to uh, destroy us. But no, he's not trying to destroy us. He's trying to build us up. He's trying to make us better. And so during the tribulation, God will wash away the filth of the world, burning away its sin, and those who remain will be called holy. Verse 5, Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud of smoke by day and a shining of the flame of fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime for, from the heat, for a place of refuge, uh, for a shelter from the storm and rain. You know, Isaiah is writing about, well, he's making a reference to when Israel, when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, out of bondage, they were going through the desert. And in the desert, you know, it can be extremely hot with no shade, no covering, but God was with them, and what did he do? He provided a cloud of covering for them. And so while they were out there, they were able to be cool because God was covering them. And at night, when it was dark, it was pitch black, what did he do? He, uh, he provided a pillar of fire to guide them. Listen, you see, the people of Israel in this day, even for the people in this world, a lot of us, a lot of people have gone astray. But God said, the work that I'm going to do when I'm finished is going to be a glorious thing. Why? Because once again, I will be the one who will bring, provide covering for the people. And wherever he moves, when you feel the, the heat, well, you know, you're not under a Lord, so you have to come back, right? And so he's going to be that covering, but he's going to be that fire that leads and guides. The Lord himself will be the one who leads and guides. We won't need pastors. We won't need bishops. We don't know. God himself will be the one who leads his people. So he goes right into chapter five. Now, Isaiah again says, um, uh, well, he's going to write now, God himself is going to write the song describing Israel as a vineyard. Look at this. He says in verse one, now let me sing to my well-beloved a, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Where is that fruitful hill? Uh, Jerusalem, right? That's that, that hill, that Mount Zion. Uh, he, he dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst and also made a wine press in it. He, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth what? Wild grapes or sour grapes. You see, uh, he, God uh, describes himself as, as a farmer who has a vineyard, who found this piece of property. Remember, David bought this property. He said, I'm not going to get anything that didn't cost me anything. David bought this property. It was God that, that allowed David to buy this property to build a temple on. But God describes this property as a fertile land, right? And God went in. He's describing himself as one who went in 
and he dug up the land. He took out all the stones. He took the stones and built a hedge of protection around this, this vineyard. And he started to plant with the choicest vines. And he started to, you know, he built a tower so that he can look out to see that everything is safe. Everyone will be safe in it. All of the plants will be protected. And then he, you know, watered it and took care of it. And what was he expecting? Listen, he was expecting good fruit. But what did he get? Wild grapes, sour grapes, bitter grapes. Do you know anyone that's bitter and sour? <laughs> you see, he says that Jerusalem is this vineyard. Look at verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard, what more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? What more could have God have done for the people of Israel? What more could God have, have done for us? You see, God wants us to produce fruit. What's the fruit that God wants us to produce? The fruit of love. Love one another. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the fruit that God wants from us. But so often we find ourselves bitter uh, against the brother. We're angry with so-and-so because they said, though, or they looked at me this way. Uh, and, and that's what happens. And God said, I've invested so much into you. You know, that's one of the things that breaks my heart. When I, I, I personally will invest in people. Uh, you know, the other day, um, someone had, I heard that someone had said this that uh, they no longer are coming back to this church. And, and so why? why? Why are we not, why are you not coming back? And, and the person said, it's because you all care too much. I said, what does that mean? Listen, that means that when they walk through those doors, that Tim and Donovan are there. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Well, what's going on in your life? Well, let me pray for you. Let, let me, how can we help you? Oh, you need some counsel. Go talk to Pastor Allen. You see? the person wants to just come in and go out and not, well, what is the church about? Is it a place that we just come and socialize? No, it's a place where people come to get help, to get encouraged, to get built up. And, and we care about people enough to say, I'm willing to even share, tell you the hard things, right? The things that you may not like, because why? Well, that is what we're called to do. And so God, uh, you know, will use us and he, 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 he you know, will, will, will build on and pour into people. And as God says here, uh, you know, what more could I have done? Judge for yourself. What more could I have done? Can't do anything more. But you see, people will continue to reject the provision of the Lord. Verse 5 through 7, God will describe what he will do to his vineyard as a result. Verse 5, and now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedges, uh, and it's, it shall be burnt and break down its walls. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. I will not be, it will not be pruned or dug. But there shall come upon, uh, excuse me, up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no uh, there will rain no rain on it. You see, God will remove that protection. If you're not receiving the, what he is doing, he's going to remove that protection. He's not going to prune. There will be no more rain, and you will be left by yourself. So verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are, the, are his pleasant plant. He, t he looked for justice, but behold... Oppression for righteousness, but for uh, but behold, a cry for help. You see, what is God expecting for, for from His people, from His vineyard? Listen, He's expecting good fruit, justice and righteousness, love and forgiveness. That is what God has wants. Because listen, that's what God has done for us, right? He's not going to ask us or require of us to do something that He He Himself is not willing to do, and so that's what He is. 
asking. That's what he's requiring. I, and that's the word that he, that's used. It, he's requiring good fruits. And verse 8, now he describes the sorrow that will come upon them as a result. Woe to those who join the house of who join house to house. They add fields to field, till there is no place where they may dwell along, uh, alone in the midst of the land. In other words, he is talking about how foreigners will come in and buy all of the house. When he says they, they join house to house, they're buying up all of the property, uh, all of the land. And what does the land and, and house do? It's, it's God's provision and his, his protection. When we have a house, is a way that we can provide protection uh, for our family from the elements, from, from attacks, from, from evil people. And God is saying that foreigners will come into your land. Listen, there's something that's happened in America, and some, most of you probably don't even know this, but because of the evil that we're doing, that foreigners are coming in and they're buying the land. What do I mean? Well, China have been buying a lot of property, especially in New York, but around the U.S., they're buying up all of the major real estate. And when you see they come in and they buy the real estate, listen, when it's time to vote, when it's time for property taxes, guess who's going to have a voice? Hey, hey, you're going to affect us with this. You need to consider us. And now you will see foreigners taking over. Listen, that's a sign of God's judgment. We need to repent as a nation. Verse 9, in my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitants. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one, uh, one ephah. So you, you see people will be planting ten acres of, of grapes and only have about six gallons of wine. A lot of work with a little, a little profit. Uh, you know, again, uh, that's because the hand of God is not upon them. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning. Anyone who rise early in the morning? That they may, what? Follow intoxicate and drink, who continues until night, till wine inflame them. In other words, he's talking about the party person. The person who gets up and the first thing they want to do is drink. Have a good time, you know. I'm going to drink from the morning. I'm going to drink all the way to the night. And, 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 you know, when you, even this morning, I heard my wife, uh, you know, doing the devotion with the kids, and she was reading from Proverbs 31. You know, it's not, it's not for kings to drink, O Lamuel, right? You shouldn't be drinking intoxicating drinks because what? It, it, it clouds your judgment. It's not for leaders to drink intoxicating drink. But do you know that the city with the highest uh, consumption rate of, of alcohol, anyone can guess where it is? Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is where our, the people who are making decisions for us, uh, that's what they're doing. They get up in the morning, hey, you want to have some coffee and some drink? Let's talk about the future of our country. Uh, what are we doing? Listen, the Bible tells us that's not what we're supposed to do, but yet that's what they do. Hey, let's make some decision. Uh, cheers, right? Uh, no, uh, listen, God, he talks about it. This is not what they're supposed to do. Verse 12, the harp and the strings, the, tap, the, the tambourines and the flutes and the wine and, their, uh, 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 and wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the, the operation of his hands. So, you, so people... Are living not only just for wine, but meant to party. All of the string instruments, all man, we want pleasure, we want party, and they just live in life, and they have no regard for God. They're not concerned about his uh, what he's doing or what he, uh, how he's he's trying to lead them. Verse thirteen. Therefore, uh oh, my people have gone into captivity because they have not knowledge. They have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, they are, uh, and their uh, multitude dried up with thirst. So, you know, when he says, therefore, the people have gone into bondage, they are going to be uh, conquered by other nations. Verse 14, therefore, Shoal has enlarged itself and opened his mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitudes and their pomp 
and, uh, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. So he's saying here, because of their rebelliousness, that the population of hell will increase. So many will go to hell because they have turned away from God. You see, it's not that God desires that anyone to go to hell. God, I mean, when you think about what it says, that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But if people go to hell, it's because they choose to by turning away from God. So he says in verse 15, people shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. The, then the lambs shall feed in their pastures, and the waste places of the fat ones strangers shall eat. So he's basically saying here, when God judges, when he prunes, when he purges his hopes, is that people will be restored in a right relationship with him. That, as he says here, that the sheep will feed in their pastures, that they will come back. You see, when God, uh, you know, judges man, it's not, when, when he punishes man, it's not because he wants to destroy, it's because he wants to bring back uh, to him uh, the people, his people. He wanted to bring them back into a right relationship with him. Again, uh, I'm, I'm just blessed by the men of this church because, Man, on Tuesday night, they're showing up, they're reading, they're feeding. They're not going into uh, sinful behaviors so that God have to spank them back into a place with, to, to eat his food. No, they're, they're voluntarily saying, you know what, I want to get in God's word because I don't want to go astray. And that's a great place to be. Verse 18 to 23, he's going to give some woes. You know, we have seen a, a couple of woes already, but he's going to give five more woes. Uh, to those who boast about their sin. Look at verse 18. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity. That word for woe in the Hebrew is oi. Uh, what, what, he's, he's, what, what God is saying is, you know, you get a picture of God in his face like, oi, <laughs> oi, people, you're hurting yourself, oi. He's not... No, whoa, you know, like, ah, I'm ready to judge. You know, it's, oh, my, my heart is breaking for the people. And he says, oi, oi, to the, those who draw iniquity uh, cords of vanity. Woe to those who draw iniquity cords of vanity and sin as if they're, uh, as if with a cart rope. Verse 19, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of, of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. You know, every year they have that uh, Macy's Christmas Day Parade and they build these big floats and, you know, they're just beautiful and they have animation, they have people dancing on them and they're being pulled along, they're on a parade route and they're boasting about their creation, right? Right? And God is saying that these people are drawing their sin with a cord. They're having a parade with their sin. And listen, it breaks God's heart. It breaks his heart. Whenever we sin, it breaks God's heart. God is, oi, oi. You ever see a mother, uh, you know, moan over a child that is hurting or that have died? Oh, that mother is in pain. That is the heart of God. God is broken about our sins. Verse 20, woe to, the, to, to those who call evil good and, and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Again, oi, God is calling, uh, you know, oi to those who call good evil and good and evil good, right? Woe, verse 21, to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to the men, uh, the mighty, at, uh, at, at, uh, at drinking wine. Woe to men, uh, valiant or, or, or you know, well-known for mixing intoxicating drink, who's justify, who justify the wicked for a bribe and takes away justice from the righteous man. 
See, God's heart is broken over all of these things that are sinful. And um, he doesn't want us or anyone to walk in sin because why? Who are we hurting? Ourselves. And God, his heart is broken over it. Verse 24, therefore, as the fire devours the stable, the stubble, and the flames consume the chaff, so, listen, their root will be rottenness, and their blossoms will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Why does God judge the wicked? Because, uh, not because He doesn't care, it's because He cares. Uh, as He says, He has dealt, you know, their root is rotten, and so He has to deal with the root of the problem. A lot of times we want to deal with the symptoms. Oh, what's going on in America? And we, we throw money and we throw all kinds of things at the, the symptoms, but the root of the problem is that we have rejected the law of God. And so God has to go down deep and He has to dig out the roots and, and tear it out so that He can uh, replant and, and, and put trees uh, that will, will produce fruit. So verse 26 to 30 now, He will call the mighty nations from around to invade the land. Look at verse 25. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against His people. He has stretched out His hands against them and stricken them. And the hills tremble. Their carcasses will, uh, were as refuse in the midst of the street. For all of his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar, and he will what whistle to them from the ends of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. So God is whistling. <whistles> Come over here. Come and defeat them. <laughs> he's calling them. And, and he's calling them to do what? To be his hand of punishment. Verse 27, no one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will, will slumber or sleep. Nor will the belt on their loins be loosed. Nor the, star, nor the strap of their sandals be broken. Uh, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' uh, hoof, uh, hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like uh, a, wheel, a, a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like a, lion, a young lion. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of their prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. In that day... They will roar against them like the roaring of a sea. And if, the, if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkness by the clouds. The light is darkened by the cloud. So, oi, <laughs> the judgment, right? The judgment is coming, but God, his heart is broken. Let me close by saying this. Listen, I think every one of us at some point will feel the hand of the Lord upon us, right? And it won't be the hand of, uh, you know, like a dad that you feel like, oh, my dad, my mom is just hugging me and love. No, it will be that heavy hand. And, and, and usually whenever that heavy hand is upon you is, again, because God loves you. And we may be doing something that's sinful that is not right. And God is saying, hey, I want to get your attention. Come back to me. Come and spend time with me. Come and eat from the, the, the from my pastures, come and, and be fed, come and spend time with me. That's what I want because what? I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. I want to give you hope in a future. But the path that you're on would lead to destruction. The path that you're on would lead to bondage. It would lead to imprisonment. The path that you're on would lead to destruction. So whenever you feel that heavy hand of God upon your life, what are you to do? You are to examine your heart. Don't justify don't make excuses, but say, Lord, surely what is it that's in my heart that's making you uh, unpleased or displeased with me? It's an opportunity for repentance, turning from your sin and turning to the Lord. And let me just also say this, and not just, uh, not, if, if you're feeling the heavy hand, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in sin. 
because sometimes when someone else sins, it affects us too, right? Just like the Israelites, the people, uh, they were righteous in the land, those who were doing right, but because of the sin of the the, of those that are around them, when God judged them, the wicked, it affected the righteous. So sometimes that happens. But even in those times, let us still examine ourselves. Lord, surely what is it that I have done? Right? It's always an opportunity for us to examine ourselves. So, Lord, as we close this time, Lord, we want to examine our hearts. Lord, if, is it I, Lord? Is there any wicked ways in me? Because, Lord, we want to be a people that are holy, that are righteous, people who do what is right and good and what is pleasing to you. So, Father, I pray that you will uh, just speak to each one of us here and show us any offensive ways in us that we may repent and confess those sins to you, that you may wash us and purge us and make us holy in your sight. So, Father, thank you for this wonderful word uh, uh, to remind us, Lord, of how much you love, how much you care. Uh, reminding us, Lord, all that you have done, taking out those stones from our hearts and put a hedge of protection around us. Lord, you have done so much. And so, Lord, we don't want to disappoint you in any way. Father, I thank you for each person that is here. I know that we are here, Lord, because we love you. And uh, we just want to just commit our lives more and more to you. Uh, so, Lord, that's, this, that's why we're here, Lord. So uh, I pray that you bless each person for their blessing, their, their pressing, Lord. Uh, coming out on a Wednesday night, Lord, I pray that you just enrich their lives with you, that they may know you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.